What a perfect opening for this series. We are once again want to welcome you, whether you're our local member who's tuning in by live stream or wherever you are in the world. We welcome you because you are family. And today we are going to do a, the second part of a three-part series. Last Sabbath, we looked at recognizing the call of God. Today, we will discuss receiving the call of God. And then next Sabbath, it will be responding to the call of God. What's so interesting about when the Lord gave me this three-part series, it perfectly matched the three steps that he gave to me when I asked him for a new way to explain surrender. And these three steps are know God. You've got to know this wonderful, loving, glorious God to be able to surrender to him. The second step is stop and submit. Stop resisting his love. Stop resisting his plan for your life and submit to his authority. And then the third step for the uh, surrender was to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you see how perfectly these all line up? You have to know God to recognize his call. And his call is on all of us. He is calling us to accept him as our father, to accept him as our savior. But then you have to stop and submit to receive his call. And that's where we're going to spend our time today, is receiving the call of God. But then also you have to yield to the Holy Spirit to respond to his call. So what we're going to do, I hope you did your homework assignment. Last week, we finished off with a homework assignment, and that was the, to ask the Lord in prayer, what is hindering me from complete surrender? You know, I've taken that very seriously. I've been praying it every night to say, Lord, show me what is hindering me from complete surrender. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as Daniel was singing, oh Lord, we come before you today and we want to be a vessel. We want to be that clay pot. I know you remember we are but dust, but we want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. We want you, the potter, to put us back together. Lord, we come to you with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. We are so very grateful, Lord, that you became a man and that you died for us. Lord, we're so very grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit and how we thank you, O oh Lord, for your powerful word. Father, you did not leave us as orphans on this earth. But you have provided these three great gifts of grace. Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, and your word. That we may know you. Oh, Lord, open our hearts to know you in a greater way. And Father, help us not only to recognize your call on our life, but to receive your call. Right now, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And we trust that you will. Give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. And Lord, give us the power to respond. We ask this in the name of Jesus, thanking you for the answer to the prayer of faith. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Receiving his call. This means that we have to stop resisting his love 
and his plan for us, it means that we have to submit to God's authority. You know what's interesting? Some people won't accept God's love because they feel they're unworthy. I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. You are worth nothing less to God than the price that he paid for you. You know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, you weren't redeemed with silver and gold or things that, that uh, have so little value. You were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, was shed for you to pay the penalty for your sin. Now, some people push God's plan away because they don't want boundaries. They won't accept God's boundaries. You know, our God is a boundary-making, boundary-keeping God. What amazes me most about God is that he put a boundary around us, and he, around himself, in fact, saying, I'm giving you free will. And I won't cross over that boundary. God leaves everything to us by choice. Why? Because love cannot be forced. Love cannot be coerced. Love cannot be demanded and still be love. But people who push God's boundaries away and the boundaries that he has given us, he's laid down his law, not to limit us. His law is the law of love and liberty. He put these boundaries and said, here is a path that is safe for you to run in, a path where you can experience abundant life now and eternal life later. Now, many people push God away because they refuse his correction. Let me ask you, are you afraid to be chastened by God? Are you open to being chastened by God? I actually pray for God's correction. I pray for his chastening, and I'll tell you why. The Bible says Perfect love drives out fear. I don't fear God's correction because I know he is a loving father. And he's, he, he's going to correct me. I mean, that's what a father does with a child. So he's either going to tune my ear in where I can be corrected just as he guides me by his eye, or I can be corrected with just a soft word saying, Shelley, that's not the way to go. But if I'm not tuned in to his correction, you know what happens? I go a little bit too far in the wrong direction. Then the Lord has to say, Shelley, Shelley. And if I continue going, then he really has to chasten me. All three of these conditions whether it is we don't think we're worthy of God's love or we don't want to accept his boundaries or we're afraid to be corrected by him. All three of these are conditions of pride. And the first step of surrender is to know God, to, to know that he knows better than we do. We've got to know God's immeasurable love, his infinite wisdom, and his exceedingly great power to change our lives. The second step of surrender is to stop and submit. Stop resisting his love. Stop resisting his plan and submit to his divine authority. We were looking at Isaiah last week. And let me just, Isaiah 6, let me just kind of summarize that. Isaiah is a man of God. He's a priest. He's in the earthly temple. 
And he's pressing into the presence of the Lord. And all of a sudden, God expanded his vision of who he was. God shows Isaiah a vision of him high and lifted up. And Isaiah is learning to know God in a greater way. And he is awestruck. And what does he do in the, in the story? It says that suddenly he becomes overwhelmed by his own uncleanness. You know, the closer we get to God, the more we realize if we recognize his glory, his character, we realize how dirty our own robes are, right? There, our robes are like filthy rags. We have no righteousness of our own. So Isaiah says, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And let me tell you something. Unclean lips means you have an unclean heart. And he says, I live among a people of unclean lips. And let me show you that. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, we'll begin with verse 34. And we're going to take a little time to look up some scriptures today. I want you to see these things. Because when, the, as I was studying Isaiah, and I realized unclean lips mean an unclean heart, boy, that'll make you stop and think before you share any gossip or backbite. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. This is Jesus speaking. And he says to the Pharisees, brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Now, here's where we understand unclean lips is an unclean heart. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Then Jesus sums it up this way. But I say to you, for every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For your words, by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Words matter to God. And our first need is to see how holy God is because only as we see God's holiness, and that simply means he's completely separated from sin, as we see God's holiness, that's when we recognize our need for change our need for sanctification, to be purified, to be, have our sins erased. So Isaiah experienced a radical change of heart. And what God did, he had the angel take a coal from the altar. This is all symbolic. But he touched, God, he was preparing Isaiah to receive a message, a mission from him. So he touched Isaiah's lips with his coal from the altar. And what I love is that here Isaiah had just become profoundly aware of his own shortcomings. But he recognizes the call of God when God says, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, even though he recognized his own shortcomings, Isaiah responds in humility, trusting that God is going to empower him. And he says, here am I, send me. Turn to your Bible, in your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Isaiah had complete trust in God's enabling power. 
Isaiah was ready to be used by God because he knew that he recognized the call of God. He's ready to receive the call of God because he understood God's love. In Ephesians chapter 3, this tells us the beginning point of how we stop resisting God's love and his plan. Ephesians chapter 3, let's begin with verse 16. Paul's praying for the Ephesians. And this is a prayer where I'm praying over you. That he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory, his limitless riches available to every believer of his glory. That's his character. And so he says, I'm praying he will grant you, according to the riches of his character, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might. How? Through his Holy Spirit in the inner man. What Paul is praying for the Ephesians, this word here, might, in the Greek, it's dunamis. He says, I'm praying that the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit will fill you. Open your hearts. Be filled with the Spirit of God. And then he says in verse 17, that, anytime you see that or so that, it's a purpose statement. So he's saying, I want you to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit for this purpose, that Christ may dwell in in your hearts through faith. He dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That, here again, is the purpose statement. Be filled with the Spirit for the purpose of Christ dwelling in your heart. And you want Christ dwelling in your heart for this purpose. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width of his love that extends to all people. What is the length of his love that extends to all time? What is the depth of his love that reaches down to the lowest pit of human condition? And what is the height of his love that is higher than all the heavens? To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge Here's another that. When you understand his love, when you are filled with the Spirit, Christ is dwelling in your heart through faith, and you recognize the width, the length, the depth, and the height of his love. Here's the purpose. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be filled with the fullness of God. Turn to 1 John, the little epistle of 1 John. See, the whole reason for us to be filled with the Spirit for the purpose that Christ may live in our hearts so that we may be filled with love and that enables us to be filled with the fullness of God. God gives us this love and the whole purpose of this love is that we will reciprocate that we will love him in return. In 1 John, let's look at chapter 4 and verse 19. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. In other words, when you understand your God, our creator God, loved us so much that he would humiliate himself to step out of heaven, come down and take on this flesh to become one of us, and then humble himself to die on a cross for us. When you realize this self-sacrificing love that God has for you and that you're worth nothing less than the price that he paid for you with the precious blood of Jesus, you can't help but love him in return. Love, how is love demonstrated? Anybody can say, 
I love you. I love you. Oh, I love you. But if their actions don't show that, we begin to real that, realize that their words are empty. God's love was demonstrated by his actions. And he wants us to demonstrate our love to him by his actions. He poured out his agape love, his, as the Hebrew calls it, the hesed, that he gave us all these gifts of grace and he asks us, what is the most important commandment? Mark 12, 30, Jesus was asked that question and he said, here's the first commandment. That's the premier this is the pinnacle of all commandments. That you would love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know what? Sometimes people get upset when I say, I can't do that. I can't do that in my own strength. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, oh, we say, yes, I have that kind of love. With all of your mind, oh, I let a lot of things get in the way where my mind's not focused on him. With all of your soul, with all of your strength, eh, sometimes we don't love God with all of our strength. We can't in our own power. And the whole point of this is God never asks us he never commands us to do anything that he doesn't empower us to do. And in Romans 5.5, 5, here's the key that unlocks this. Romans 5.5 5 says that God pours his love, his self-sacrificing love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. It is only as God empowers us to keep his commandments that we can keep his commandments. And what he asks of us, even though we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are saved for good works, and he asks that if we love him, we keep his commandments, that we walk in submissive obedience, trusting his infinite knowledge, trusting his immeasurable love, and trusting his exceedingly great power for us to do that. Now, our obedience is how we demonstrate our love to God. Our obedience is how we demonstrate covenant loyalty. It has nothing to do with saving us. We're only saved by the blood of Jesus. But it is proof that the Holy Spirit's living in us, that Christ is living in our hearts by faith, that we are learning the love of God, the height, the width, the length, the depth, and that we're putting it into action. Turn to 2 John chapter 1 and verse 6. And I want to give you a homework assignment for this afternoon. If you want to understand love for God, I want to suggest this afternoon, read 1 John. It's just five little chapters. But read 1 John because over and over. Actually, let's look at 1 John 2, 4 first. I'm sorry. 1 John 2 and verse 4. John in his epistle shows us repeatedly that to love God is to walk in obedience. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. Ooh, listen to this. He who says, I know him. And that's that intimate knowledge of God. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is what? He's a liar and the truth is not in him. See, 
To know God is to love him. We love him because he first loved us. But if we love God, if we acknowledge him as not only our creator, but our redeemer and our father, we're going to walk in obedience to his love and his plan. Now turn to 2 John. 2 John 1, 6. 2 John 1, 6. John is very succinct in his statement. He says, 2 John 1, 6. This is love. You, you can sing to the Lord all day long. And you can feel like you're lifted up and, oh, I'm singing, I'm having such a good time. Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. But he says, this is love that we walk. That means we're conducting our lives according to his commandments. This is the commandment, as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Oh, Hallelujah. We don't have to guess what actions, as God pours his love into us, what actions that should prompt. It should prompt obedience motivated by love. Now, turn back to the, uh, the Gospel of John, because I really want to make this point. The Gospel of John, let's look at John 1 and verse 12. John 1 and verse 12 says, As many as received him, received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Believing in Jesus is to be living in Jesus. As many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. When we call upon his name and accept him as our savior, we're receiving him. But we've also got to receive him as our Lord. And as our Lord, we have to acknowledge his claims on our life and yield our allegiance to him. I think John so well understood this. In 1 John 3, 1, he said, Oh, behold, what manner of love that we should be called children of God. Are you a child of God? The interesting thing we see in the natural realm, the small child, the young child, is so totally dependent upon their parent. And then as they grow, they become a little more independent. It's just the reverse in the spiritual realm. We've been trained all of our life to be independent. And suddenly we come to a God whose whole plan of salvation is total dependence upon him. And as we grow in maturity in Christ, we surrender more. We yield more. And the greater the surrender to God, the greater the intimacy with God, we're yielding more to his leading, being emptied of self and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just have to say this. If this little bottle is only half full now, how much can I fill it up? I can pour in half of the bottle, right, to fill it up with something else. Well, Now it's two-thirds empty. How much can I fill this bottle with? Two-thirds of a cup. Now it's totally empty. How much can it be filled with? This is us 
as Daniel sang, as a vessel of God. When we are only emptied of self halfway, that's all we're making room for the Lord. But if as we grow in maturity, we learn to be emptied of self, we can be filled more and more with the Spirit of God and become like Christ. Turn to James. Dear James, we want the grace of God. So James tells us, as we're growing in the knowledge of the Lord, as we're growing in grace, we are going to become more humble. And listen what James 4, 6 says. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know what the meaning of the word humility is? Paul said in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself. Christ, as our creator God, the second person of the Godhead, came down and became the son of God, the covenant son of God. And he gave up self-will. He was totally dependent upon the Father, and the Holy Spirit, just as we have to live. So the more we learn to humble ourselves, that means we're going to be more dependent upon God, then we will get that grace. And then in James 4, 7, he says, therefore, if you want grace, he's, he's saying God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, if you want this grace, Submit yourself to God. Submission is humility. Submission means, yes, Lord, I'm going to receive your instructions, your direction, your correction. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submission is a decision of our will. It's our unconditional love. It's as God pours his agape love into us, we have that self-sacrificing love that we are returning to God saying, okay, Lord, I trust you. I will be submissive. Self-will negates love. Self-will negates love and lawlessness causes love to wane and grow cold. So our conscience, conscious decision is to yield to his power, his superior intelligence, and his authority as our sovereign ruler. But God will never force you to yield. God will never force you to even accept his love. We just have to purposely determine to follow his leadership. And here's the interesting thing. The word submission is a military term. Submission, when we submit to God, God is the head of the church. God is our creator, our redeemer. God is the one who sanctifies us. To submit means we line up under his authority. It's like when we pray like Jesus, not by will but yours be done. We are lining up that submission. We're lining up under his authority. And when you are lined up under his authority, you know the good news is the devil has no power over you. When you're lined up under God's authority, you've just canceled the devil's power over you. Let me read to you. And if you want to turn there, it wouldn't be a bad idea. We'll just keep a finger in James or put a marker because we're going to come back there. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13. Paul says something amazing. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands, do you think you stand firm? 
Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And in verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He always makes, as, as you resist the devil, submit to God. He always gives you the way out. Now, I have to just point this out because this is a hobby horse for me. Some people say, oh, God doesn't put on us more than we can bear. That's not what this scripture says. The scripture says God doesn't allow us to be tempted beyond what we bear, can bear. But in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, Paul says by his own admission, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength. He said, what happened to us? We had a sentence of death on us. It was more than we had the strength to bear. But he says, God allowed this to happen so that it was a test, so that we would learn to depend on him who raises the dead. So it, there are times, and, and it, I think it, it's frustrating to me when somebody's going through a difficult time and then they say, Oh, God doesn't allow more than we can bear. Yeah, sometimes he does. Sometimes it is absolutely more than we can bear. I've been through a two-year trial with my surgeries. It was beyond measure. When you are in an 8 to a 10 pain for 18 months in a row, it was beyond my measure, but God taught me to depend on him. God taught me to have a thankful heart and just focus on what I did have rather than what I didn't have. And he drew me nearer to him as I drew near to him. As a matter of fact, that's James 4, 8. If you've still got a finger in James, James 4, 8 says... Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. See, as we draw near to God, when we understand his love, when we understand his plan for our lives, you know what happens? Our heart longs for communion with our Savior. And when you're communing with the Savior... When you're pursuing that intimate love relationship with him, he is so excited. He's got his arms around you. And when we acknowledge our total dependence upon him to save us, he is going to reach down, draw us up to his bosom, and he's going to help us through. You know, obedience is the highest expression of worship. Obedience brings righteousness and the gift of eternal life. Turn to 1 John 2, 28 and 29. 1 John chapter 2. I am a huge proponent of righteousness by faith. People say, well, do you believe in righteousness by faith? Of course. Throughout the Bible, it tells us righteousness by faith is the only kind of righteousness that there is. It is only as Christ's righteousness is credit, credited to me that I have any hope of salvation. But I, I really found this fascinating. In 1 John 2, verse 28, John says, Now little children... Abide in him, dwell in him, make your home in him, that when he appears you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Don't you want to have confidence at his coming? And then he says something so interesting. 
in verse 29. 1 John 2, 29. If you know that he, Christ, is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Well, wait a minute. Righteousness is by faith, right? But he says, hey, if you're not practicing righteousness, you're not born again of God. See, when we are born of God, we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We get a new spiritual DNA. Instead of the devil's nature acquired, we get, as the Bible tells us, the divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. You are made righteous by faith so that you can act in righteousness. So the whole idea of receiving his call requires relationship. And you know what relationship requires? Conversation. How do we converse with the Lord? Well, we pick up our Bibles. We let him talk to us through his word. And we talk to him through prayer. If you're not having a daily Bible study, if you're not ingesting some of his word on a daily basis, you are crimping the development of your relationship if you don't let him talk to you. We have to look at the words, not to just study and ask, answer Sabbath school panel questions, but we have to look at the word so that we can know him. On an int the only reason I know my husband intimately is we talk daily. I know his patterns. I know his love for me. And we have to get in the word of God and let God talk to us. And then we need to submit to his instructions as he speaks to us daily through prayer, I mean through the word, and we need to pray to receive his direction. And we need to pray and say, Lord, let me receive your correction. So let's look at those three steps of submission. We submit to his instructions. When Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil to perform a miracle and turn the stones into bread. If I'd been 40 days without food and I had the inherent power that I could look at a rock and say, become a loaf of bread, boy, that would have been a temptation to use your, your personal power, wouldn't it? It's more than just hunger. The devil was trying. See, the reason God became a man is so that he, he was going to become the last Adam. The first Adam failed. The last Adam came here to live totally in submission to the Father and the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. He could not use his inherent powers or the experiment was over. If he had used his divine powers, he couldn't have died for us because he only could die for us as a man of flesh. So what happens in Matthew 4.4, 4, when the devil is saying, turn these stones into, into bread, Jesus answers him. And in all of his answers, he's referring back to Deuteronomy, but he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Christ's source of spiritual strength was obedience 
to God's word. He was encouraged by God's word. He, it was obedience to God's will. And our sustenance of spiritual strength, our spiritual energy comes from eating the bread, the word of God. If you go very long, if you go all through the week without reading the word, I guarantee you, come Sabbath, you're a little spiritually weakened. But when we hunger and thirst for righteousness and we go to the, the Bible and say, Lord, I want to know you, I want to know your plan, God fills us, doesn't he? That's his promise. We need to learn to take this word and apply it to ourselves personally. So I believe when you ask what's hindering me from total surrender, maybe it's just discipline. Maybe you're not disciplining, your, disciplining yourself to seek God's word daily. You know, Jesus had said in John 17, 17, Oh, sanctify them by the truth, Lord. Set them apart from evil. Sanctify means to be set apart for God's purposes. Set apart from evil. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. We were born by the living and enduring word of God. And you know what the word does? It makes us love what God loves. And we learn to hate what God hates. God hates sin. James said in James 1.21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So when we think about what Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth is a person. It's the second person of the Godhead, the Word of God, who became flesh, became the covenant Son of God. And he's saying, if you know the truth, you're going to be set free. You will become, as you become an obedient follower, you, your life will be submitted and committed to Christ. Now, turn to Mark 4. Verse 26, some people expect that when they receive the Lord, woohoo, everything changes. You know what? Development of his character comes a little at a time. It takes us a while to, to learn to let go of certain things. So you're not, just because you're not perfect, if you, let, let me read this and then I'll come back. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Remember the parable of the seed that Jesus told? What did he say the seed was? The seed is the word of God. So as you scatter the seed on the ground, you're asleep, but the, the word is alive and active. And it begins to sprout and grow. And he says, then the earth yields crops by itself. First, the blade Sometimes you put a promise of God in your heart. Maybe you've memorized it or you're claiming it, you're praying it. And one day, it, it may not have a whole lot of meaning to you, but one day, boing, this little blade pops up and you're going, yeah. You know what? At that point, you are perfect in your development. You may not be perfect in the eyes of everyone else, but when you're planting that seed and it boing, at that point of your development, you are perfect. He says, then the head, it keeps growing. Now, if you just stay as a little blade, got a problem. But suddenly the head begins to blossom 
at that point, that stage in your life, you're perfect in Christ. But then you can't just stay there. The full grain in the head develops. Let me tell you something. And I've used this before. I love this illustration the Lord gave me. If I have a handful of corn here and a handful of wheat here, if I plant corn to my left, what crop am I going to get? Corn. If I plant wheat over here, what crop am I going to get? Wheat. Why? The potential of the harvest is wrapped inside the seed. All of your potential, all of your potential is wrapped inside the seed of his word. Your only responsibility is to plant that word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. You've got to know what the word says. If you don't know the promises of God, if you never get into his Bible, you don't know. But when you plant that word through a reading, and, and here's, I mean, when I first really began studying the Bible, I'd read something and I'd say, what do you mean, Lord? He loves those kind of questions. You don't have to understand everything you're reading. Sometimes I'd read something and I'd go like, Lord, what does that mean? And he will meet the challenge. Within a week or two, suddenly I'd be reading along and a scripture would light up and it'd just be like a neon sign blinking. And I'd think, oh, that's what he meant over here. And you begin to join scripture to scripture. The word is alive and active. And when you plant it, it has the power to grow. The blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 is such a wonderful promise. I love this scripture. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, His divine power has given to us all things, everything that is necessary that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Remember, you've got to know him to recognize his call on your life. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which, by his glory, his character, his virtue, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises for this purpose. That through these promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I think it is so important to pray the word of God. To confess the word of God over your life. Because Isaiah 55, 11, God says, My word will not return to me void. Jeremiah 1, 12 says, He is watching over his word to perform it. Romans 4, 17 says, God calls things that are not as though they already were. He sees the end from the beginning. So when he says we're anointed, we've got to say, Lord, I don't feel anointed, but thank you. If you say I am, I believe I am. Fill me every day with your Holy Spirit. Pray that every day. And then we begin to overcome the identity crisis. Turn back to 1 John. It is so important that we accept the word of God. It is so important that we believe God's testimony of who we are in Christ. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says, He who believes in the Son of God. 1 John 5, verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who does not believe God, ooh, he who does not believe God has made him a liar. 
because he's not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. Are you abiding in Christ? Then you've got the gift of eternal life. He says, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And then he goes on, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You can say it. It is not a sin. If you are abiding in Christ, you have assurance of your salvation. Now, that's not once saved, always saved. We're going to see a sec in a minute. If you leave God, he's going to leave you to your own. But as long as you abide in Christ, you can have assurance of salvation. So that's how we submit to his instruction. We get into the word, let the word get into us. We've got to submit to his direction through prayer. In 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face forevermore. And I love Psalm 27, verse 8, where David says, Oh, Lord, when you said, Seek your face, Oh, Father, your face I saw it. You know what that's terminology for? To seek his face means you're seeking his personal presence. And if you're abiding in Christ, he's promised that he is always with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. But we need to turn toward God in complete devotion. Look Let's, let's look at Hebrews 4, and we're taking a little extra time since we have it today to look up some of these scriptures. Hebrews 4, verse 14. And I have to tell you just a quick advertisement here. Statistics show that when you read online, if you're reading just the... Uh, something on your phone or on your computer or on the screen, did you know you retain only half of what you read compared to you if you actually get into a book? Since I've, you know, I've been doing a lot of studying on my computer. The Bible's on my computer. Because it's very easy then for me to cop and paste, copy and paste. But after reading that, I'm making it a goal to start it used to be that I knew every where every scripture was if it was at the bottom of the page or the middle of the page but I've relied too much on computers so we want to get into our book Hebrews 4 verse 14 we got to press into his presence in prayer and, and part of our prayer time should be the word. And in Hebrews 4.14, it says, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, what does he mean, therefore? We can come boldly to the throne of grace because he understands us. Let us come, therefore, boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace in time of need. We all know, most of us know, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, where God says, hey, I've got a plan for your life. A plan to prosper you, not to harm you. And he says, then you will come and seek me. When? When we recognize that God has a plan for us. And that plan includes the power for us to believe, to repent and turn to him. Calling up him in sincere prayer. Psalm 14, 2 says, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek him. 
God knows the heart of all. But here, it's, it's just depicting in human terms that he's looking down from heaven, surveilling the actions of men. Well, God's not ignorant of our actions. But praise God that he remembers we are but dust. And he recognizes, he recognizes that if we were left to our frailty, to our own devices, that we would be powerless. That's why Jesus said in Luke 11 and verse 9, Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And in the Greek, those words are linear verbs. What Jesus is saying is ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And then he tells us in verse 13 what we're asking for. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father, the Father of your spirit, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and keep on asking? we got to listen for the still, small voice. You know, uh, Psalm 46, 10, God says, Be still and know that I am God. So as we're praying, make the word part of that. We're listening for direction. God doesn't just instruct us. He directs us. So we submit to his instruction, submit to his direction, and submit to his correction. How do you submit to his correction? You give God permission to root out all unrighteousness in your heart. Remember, if you're only half empty, he can only fill you with half. So you keep saying, Lord, clean me up. Root out the unrighteousness. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Lead me in the way everlasting. And you invite his discipline. Open to Hebrews 12. I just, we're getting close. We're getting close. Hebrews 12, verse 10. This, for some reason, I have from the NIV. Hebrews 12, verse 10 says, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. Now, you may have had, you know, if you had a good earthly father, he still wasn't perfect, but he disciplined you for your good. If you had a bad heavenly father, you may have had some messed up discipline. But listen to what he says. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness, that we may be removed from sin. And he says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You know, God is the perfect father. There are times that I have come to God and I expect, that he is really getting ready to discipline me. Instead, he comforts me. Then there's times that I've come to God thinking I'm doing pretty okay, expecting to be comforted, and he gives me a word of discipline. But he's the perfect father. He never disciplines us when we need comfort, and he never comforts us when we need discipline. God has the very perfect plan in mind for you. This is why 1 John in chapter 2 verse 15, he says, hey, don't love the things of the world. God's not in it. He says, if anyone loves the world, the Father's not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father. And the world is passing and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. See, what we don't understand is God has the very best in mind for you. 
What is it in this decaying world system that we're holding on to that is preventing God's perfect plan? Think about that. Some of us are in the, in the trouble we're in because we won't accept God's best. That's why we need to pray, oh, not my will, but yours be done, oh Lord. In Proverbs 29, 1, there's a warning. It says, he who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Whew. What's he saying? God's patiently wooing us by his love, wooing us to obedience. But if we have an unteachable heart, if we obstinately continue down the path of destruction, judgment is going to be swift. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be sure. It's going to be final. Second Chronicles 15.2. Just mark this one down because this will surprise a lot of people. I remember it surprised me the first time I got to it. Second Chronicles 15, 2. The Lord is with you while you are with him. I'll never leave you or forsake you. But it says if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So if you turn you're back on God, saying, don't bother me anymore. I don't need you. I don't want you. Guess what? God is never going to cross that boundary of free will. He will do everything he can by his kindness and his goodness to bring you to repentance. And we know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But we need to absolutely follow, submit to his instruction, submit to his direction, and submit to his discipline. I'm going to ask Danielle to come back up. When we return to the Lord, when we turn away from our sinful living to God's way of living, God doesn't want us to have a conscience that is under condemnation. He says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, God is saying, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old, but I will do a new thing in, hope, in you. Now it shall spring up. Shall you not know it? I'll even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You've got to know God to recognize this call. You have to stop and submit. Stop resisting his love. Stop resisting his plan. Submit to his authority to receive his call. And next weekend, October the 30th, we will look at yielding to the Holy Spirit so that we can respond to his call. Right now, I just want to say this. God loves you. He loves you so much that he became a man. He became the covenant son, the last Adam. He went back to heaven. Now, he is the new representative of mankind, sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He understands us and he says, come to me. I'm your high priest. I have perfect understanding of you. Some of us have been in church for many years, many years, and have never totally surrendered to God. Some of us, it's a cultural thing. It's just our habit. We get up and go to church every Sabbath morning. 
Some of us just didn't know that we needed to surrender and be filled with the Spirit day by day. And Jesus tells the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open up to me, I will come in and I will dine with him and he with me. If you have not received Christ as your Savior, I pray that you will understand today the Savior is waiting. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for your plan of salvation. How we praise you and thank you for your grace. And Lord, we are learning who you are. We want to know you and recognize the call. But right now, for all of us, this may be our first time <clears throat> to open our hearts to you. Or maybe it's just time that we need a new touch. We want to receive your call. Oh Lord, we know we're sinners and that you're our only hope. We ask that you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, even now. Oh, live in our heart, Lord Jesus, through faith. And we thank you that as many as received you, you give us the privilege of becoming a child of God. Thank you for all that you are to us, for all that you do to us. Now, we want to learn also how to respond to your calls. So bring us back again on October the 30th that we may learn how to walk in response to your call. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Thanking you for the answer to the prayer of faith.